Hey, Mag, can you hear me? Meg, I can't unmute you. Hey, John, how are you? I have to remember to unmute myself when I talk. I'm doing great. How about yourself? Uh, doing well, um, as best kids could be expected, I guess, at this time, but doing well. Thank you. Yeah. I hope your family is staying safe. Yes. Uh, wife's out in the backyard with a garden right now, and and the two of us are hunkered down. 
it's I know it's warm out here. I hope it's not too warm out there to be out back gardening. It's it's not too bad here. Uh, uh, if if you haven't, uh, you either need to be an iguana or have air conditioning if you live out where you're at. That is true. That is true. <laughs> yes, that's one of the conditions of house purchase is not only location, 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 but AC, AC, AC. <laughs> Oh, the um, I have to tell you that being where we are, that the temperate, I'm, I'm right between the the chill of the the bay and and the heat where you're at, and for literally decades since I've been here for about thirty plus years, my wife and I said it ain't that bad, and uh, it's not worth the money for putting in air conditioning. Uh, you know, since global warming has shown up, we find ourselves a lot more vulnerable. Number one. Uh, or a lot more frequent. And then since we get older, uh, I've turned into a much more of a wimp. And about three years ago or two years ago, we ended up getting air conditioning. We're going, oh man, now it's, I can breathe again. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I know when we first moved from New York with the humidity from back east, I would come out here and people would be like, oh, it's so hot. I'm like, oh, this is nothing. So but over time, in my case, it's been 41 years since I was back in New York. Um, yeah, you gradually start to get acclimated to your new temperature. And then you go back east and you're like, oh, my gosh, this humidity is killing me. So, yeah. 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 Been there, done that. It's all good. Yeah. My sister did that. Uh, she grew up in the Bay Area. And then she goes and marries a guy and they moved to Modesto. And it's routinely triple digit. Yes. You know, and they don't even think about it until it gets to be, be about 110. She came here and it was about 89 degrees and, uh, and she couldn't breathe because of the humidity in comparison wow. to the way it is in the Central Valley. Oh yeah, because it's so dry, exactly. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I know. That's why we, it's funny whenever I, you know, I used to, when I leave work in Oakland and it would be like 75 and I get home and it would be a hundred. And it was that that wave when you went through the Caldecott and they, the bar yeah. train opened up in Lafayette or Orinda and it was that first like wall of heat coming at you. Yeah. So, yeah, I kind of miss that. Um, all right, well, I'm gonna go on mute for the moment. Hello, anybody hear me? Yes, I can yeah, hear you. Yeah, I've got you loud and clear, Les. John McFarland here. Hi, John. How are you doing? Hey, we see Les now. Hi, Les. Mark Foley. Hey, hey, Mark. How are you? I'm doing warm in my neck of the woods in Antioch, but otherwise, I'm doing good. Yeah, Les is in Fremont, <laughs> which can get a little toasty. Or something with my microphone, I'm not getting very good. Mr. Mansinger, all you need to do is turn up the volume. Turn off the volume? No, no, turn it up louder. We can hear you just fine.
Okay, I'm hearing you fine. Um, turn up volume. <laughs> Hey, Lori. Okay. Turn up volume. How do I turn my volume? system. Hi, folks. Latifa here. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. This is afternoon. Patty. We have, um, we have a quorum of both bodies, and it's just about 4 o'clock, so I don't know how you want to proceed. Let's get started. I'm curious, how many people do we have on the phone? I have 23 attendees. Okay. And 20 panelists. Great. Uh, why don't we start the meeting and then why don't we start with the roll call? All right. Let me see. Meg, can you unmute yourself? You want to go first? I'll unmute her. You hear that? Okay. Okay. 
Meg, we can't hear you. Can you hear us? Hear me? There you go. Yes. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Member Armstrong. Present. Member Bruno. Here. Member Davis. Member Todd Davis. Okay. Member Gomez. Member Longmire? Oh, okay. Thank you, Member Gomez. Member Longmire? Member Lou? Present. Member Mensinger? Member Mensinger? Okay. He's here. He is having trouble with his recording now. Okay. Member Perez Velez? Present. Member Riz? Here. Member Darren White. Member William White. Here. Okay, Mr. Chair, I have a quorum present of the BPCRB. Thank you. Let's do the, the roll call for the Board of Directors. Okay, um, before we get started, if there are anyone who called in via telephone and you're a director, if you could please raise your hand. Uh, just so we make sure that we've got everyone um, identified correctly. Um, so we'll go ahead and start with the BART roll call. We have two hands raised. Okay, we have two hands raised. One moment. Michael Petrella. He is not a member of the board. Okay. Okay. Um, we have a 360 number. Yeah, a number, which I don't recognize. Okay, so we'll get to you for public comment in a minute. Director Saltzman. Here. Wow. Director Allen. Here. Director Ames. Here. Director Dusty. Here. Director Foley. Present. Director Lee. Here. Director McPartland. Here. Director Rayburn. President Simon. Good afternoon. I'm here. Thank you. We have a quorum. Okay, thank you. Um, as is our tradition, we will recite the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, everyone's free to stand or take a kneel as they, as they see fit. Uh, Mr. Mensiger, could you please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? He's having audio problems right now. Um, I can help lead the Pledge of Allegiance. He's having audio problems. Go ahead, Meg. Let's start. Okay. I pledge allegiance. Pledge allegiance to the flag, to the flag of the United States, of, the United States, United States, States of, America. of America and to the Republic, and the Republic and for which it stands, one nation, one nation, one nation under God, 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 God indivisible, liberty, and justice for all. Thank you. Director, um, has just joined. Excellent. Hey. Okay, uh, I wanna welcome everyone to this special meeting of the BART Police Department Citizen Review Board. Um, for those of you who don't know, the Citizen Review Board provides oversight to the BART Police Department and advises the BART Board of Directors. And as you just heard, the directors are also present for our meeting this afternoon. We're dedicating this important meeting to planning changes to the BART Police Department and our public safety model on BART trains in order to de-emphasize the use of armed police services, especially for matters such as homelessness, behavioral health and substance abuse and other issues which are not law enforcement matters. This is an important opportunity for the board of directors and the general manager and the police department to hear from this citizen review board in the community. Let me say at the outset that um, time is of the essence tonight, given how many people we have here in the scope of the discussion. And I will be asking everyone to be mindful of the time so that all can be heard. Um, and with that said, I wanna guarantee everyone that this will not be your only opportunity to be heard on these matters. Um, there will be additional opportunities for everyone in the weeks ahead, as you'll hear as we go along. Um, the first uh, item of substance today is opening remarks. remarks and um, so I would like to introduce Latifa Simon, president of the BART Board of Directors. President Simon has served on the board since 2016. She represents uh, District 7, which includes parts of San Francisco, Alameda, and Contra Costa counties. She's a, a lifelong BART rider, 
Um, she's a dedicated advocate for civil rights and ra racial justice. And so I'm pleased to turn it over to her uh, today for opening remarks at this meeting. Take it away. Thank you, Chair. I'll be quick. Um, this is an opportunity, I believe, for both bodies and thanks to both bodies and the members who are listening for um, your, your dedication to Bay Area Rapid Transit and to the transformation of our institution uh, writ large. Um, this opportunity for, I will speak for myself and hopefully for members of our board, gives us a greater lens and an appreciation to the work that you all have been doing. And we understand that this board is a volunteer board. So again, um, the idea that a public institution who has created an oversight body uh, made up of uh, men, women, and folks from around uh, the Bay Area is one of uh, the many aims that Bay Area Rapid Transit has moved in our pursuit to um, become a world-class institution from a public safety perspective and oversight perspective, but also understanding that um, you all are the ones um, who we're working for. I'm interested today to, as we all are, hear about uh, the work that's being done on the CRP and also for you all to get an understanding of the many conversations that our board has been having. I think we can all say that across the country and frankly across the world, we're participating in honest and difficult conversations about how communities can reimagine safety, bringing in multiple stakeholders from, of course, law enforcement, from community, from business, um, and from local electeds. We're going to get there. And BART has a tremendous history of reforming um, its, its law enforcement body. And I think from the perspective of me as the president and from our chief, we both know um, that all sectors transform and, you know, and, and reimagine how they can be the best that they can be. And I believe that that is a spirit from which we are all coming. So thank you all so much for participating. And I look forward to a meeting, learning a lot, being in an extremely critical conversation to move us along. Thank you so much. Thank you, Latifa. Um, I'm gonna give a few remarks uh, now, which I hope will help frame the discussion for, for folks who have not been close to them to date. Um, and in holding this meeting and addressing the RCI today, um, that's the measure that's under discussion. There's several areas that I, I build consensus on. Um, I think we should all acknowledge that our police department Chair, Chair, I will but I will try not to butt in for the rest of your meeting. But if we could give a so just some brief uh, uh, sort of ground not ground rules or housekeeping rules for the meeting before you go, because I would hate for anyone speaking to not be able to uh, articulate what they're saying because of background noise. I'll let you do the ground rules or the housekeeping rules. Sure. So um, please, if everybody could mute themselves when they're not speaking, that will help um, limit. Um, limit feedback. Um, and if you want to speak and you're on the phone and you're a director, please raise your hand. We'll get to public comment um, after opening remarks. Um, and in the meantime, again, I want to urge people to be mindful of the time limits that are suggested. Um, is there anything else, President Simon, that you wanted me to, to get out there? I think that I think that that's right. And I, I also think um, uh, we all need to be mindful of time, clearly. Um, and uh, the chair for this meeting will not be me. It will be our chair for our CRB. Um, and so I want to thank you for uh, organizing this meeting. And we look forward to your facilitation as well. Thank you. Um, oops. Okay. I think we should all take a moment to acknowledge that um, the Bar Police Department has been on the forefront of policing reforms for over a decade. Um, and yet we're here because we still have major challenges and injustices to address together with the community as the recent events have really reminded us. Um, and I will be among the first to acknowledge um, that even with our, our oversight system, the Bar Police Department still faces fear and skepticism from some in our communities, including some of my constituents in San Francisco. Um, to many of our riders, uh, the officers are viewed as allies to many, including folks, many folks of color, that's, not, that's simply not the case. Um, I think it must be said that there remains pervasive implicit bias and racism, racism in our policing system. 
And this is true in our department, just as it is true in most departments, probably all departments and truly in ourselves, it must be acknowledged. I hope we can acknowledge this um, with respect for one another. Um, this is our reality. We need to dedicate ourselves to changing it um, because the community expects it and it's the right thing to do. It's a moral obligation. Um, second, I hope that we can build on the common understanding um, and achieve some measure of consensus on the scale of changes that we're pursuing here today. The RCI broadly calls for fundamental changes to the way we handle homelessness, um, behavioral and mental health and substance use specifically. Um, but I hope we are on the same page that structural changes cannot be limited to these areas alone. In my view, importantly, quality of life and fair evasion enforcement in the use of force must also be scrutinized. Um, we have been tracking data on those on all of these issues for uh, two to three years um, in some in some areas uh, with more sophistication than, than others. And unfortunately, the, the numbers have not changed. Um, and the impact has not on our community has not changed to the extent um, that we should expect and demand. So well, uh, I hope there is some consensus um, that at this point in time, we do need fundamental structure, structural changes to address what are uh, um, persistent injustices. Um, so I would like to reaffirm with this RCI that we are ready to make bold changes to the entire safety model on the trains. Third, and, and perhaps most importantly, because I hope that the first um, two points of consensus are in fact that, I think we need to build some consensus on the logistics for our process from now until October and beyond. Um, I hope we're all on the same page that we cannot realistically make sweeping changes to public safety on the trains in just two months. We can begin the process and we should hold ourselves accountable for progress come October but implementing changes of this scope will take more time. Um, so I believe we need to move urgently, um, but also thoughtfully and get it right. I'm also uh, supportive of the need for independent expertise in this process. I, I think we need eyes that can look at our system critically with credibility and recommend specific form, reforms. Um, we've had success enlisting outside help in the past um, and we've seen it work in other departments. Um, so I, I support enlisting a facilitator. Um, but lastly, I also want to reserve an important role for this citizen review board. And that's because this board is designed to provide the public a voice. Um, this, and, and I trust that in this process, community input will be highly valued. This meeting, I think, is an important first step. I look forward to public comment. We will be holding further meetings of the CRB before October to receive updates on this work and to provide the public an opportunity to weigh in on it with public comment. So for the individuals and organizations who are invested in this issue and have been impacted um, by police and BART, please participate. We definitely need you to succeed. Um, lastly, like President Simon, I want to acknowledge that this is a sensitive and difficult process um, for all stakeholders. I hope we can hear each other and work towards um, a consensus on these issues. Um, and I wanna turn it over next um, to the general manager. Um, Mr. Powers, Bob Powers was unanimously appointed general manager in, in January, 2019 uh, by the board of directors. He's responsible for managing BART's operations and departments, including the police department. So his office will definitely play a leading role in this process. Um, and I'll turn it over to Mr. Powers for more opening remarks. Person risk uh, for those kind remarks. So we're having this discussion today as the nation is having conversations about reimagining policing. As we've, as you just heard from Chairperson Risk and Board President Simon at BART, we've made commitment. We've made the commitment to progressive policing. And we've been advancing reforms for more than a decade now. But we also know that the process of reform is never complete. And that there is always, and I repeat, there is always room for improvement. So as we embark on this meeting here, I, I feel, and the BART team feels, this is an opportunity for me 
and for the BART board to hear from the CRB as we begin a robust stakeholder process on um, progressive policing. And you're going to hear a little bit more from that from um, Rod Lee, the AGM of External Affairs, in this meeting. Um, if I could just build off of Chairperson's risks um, statement, um, I thought it was very um, key, you know, that he made the statement that I had here, too, that the CRB is the voice of the public and that we believe that the beginning, that us beginning this journey with the CRB is paramount, that um, they are and have been the key stakeholder of policing at BART, um, at the same time working very closely with Russell Bloom, the independent police auditor, you know, that that is the voice of the public. So us starting this this outreach effort with the CRB um, is, is intentional. Um, so I just wanted to acknowledge that. And then the last thing I'll say, Chairperson Risk, is um, that it's important that we hear from the entire CRB as we move forward in this process and hopefully that we can um, get to consensus in moving forward on this thing. And to get there, I think we need to hear from the entire uh, CRB membership. So with that, I will turn this back over to you, Chairperson Risk. Thank you, Mr. Powers. Um, next, I want to introduce to everyone Don Casimir. Um, we've invited Mr. Casimir to the meeting today to assist in facilitating the discussion and also for his um, counsel and insight and advice. Um, for those who, of you who don't know Mr. Casimir, he has a long history in policing and police oversight, including at the district. Uh, Mr. Casimir was a Berkeley officer and a sergeant for 12 years and he has spent um, the last several decades in police oversight around the Bay Area, which he will tell you more about himself. Um, he played a very important role in setting up the existing BART police oversight model. And he is a founder of the National Association for Civilian Oversight of Law Enforcement, NACOL, which is a leading organization, a, a very well-respected one. Um, this past year, he's also a member of, of the BART oversight community in this past year. Um, for example, he sat on a, a panel to discuss oversight with Oscar Grant's uncle, uh, Safest Johnson, affectionately known to us as Uncle Bobby. Mr. Kazmier, uh, do you have some remarks that you'd like to make to open the, the meeting? Uh, I do. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman Risk. Uh, I'm, I'm pleased to be here. I, this is not my first go around with Bart, as you, as you heard, but I'm pleased to be back. And I came back from retirement because Bart is uh, as dear to my heart and the relationship between the BART Police Department and the community it serves is a very important relationship. So I'm here to do what I can uh, to help out. I would like to say that I'm not here as an expert on anything, but I am here bringing some experience uh, creating police oversight agencies in Richmond, San Francisco, and Sacramento. I will also say that I have been pleased since 1984 to work uh, with the International Association for Civilian Oversight from 84 to 94, of which I was a founding board member and a past president. I helped to found NACOL in 1994, which is uh, probably the premier agency in terms of civilian oversight here um, in the United States. And a little side note, I encourage you all to check out the NACOL website and pull down training opportunities and information that's available via webinar to, to check that out for your own edification uh, and, and understanding. We are here tonight to begin the stakeholder process uh, for BART, looking at ways that we can address the health department, can change its model perhaps to de-emphasize using sworn police officers in homeless issues, behavioral health issues, substance abuse issues, among others. And we're also here to begin the dialogue of how we can restructure and have a different public safety model that is more effective here uh, to deal with racially biased uh, policing and just make it a better police service for the community. So this is the first step in a stakeholder process that will take uh, weeks, if not months, into the future 
And it's appropriate that that first step begins with the PCRB members giving advice and information and their uh, recommendations to the board of directors. The board wants to hear from the PCRB members in this meeting as start of the stakeholder process. Now, we have to be mindful of the time, and it's been said before, that we have two hours and we've got a lot of ground to cover. But a couple of the most important things we, we're going to hear today is from the PCRB members. You have 35 minutes for the PCRB members to make their comments. So we need to be brief, concise, uh, and, and do the best we can with that. Then we hear from the directors. Uh, and so we want to be mindful of the time um, so that we can maximize the use of our time and be as effective as possible. I'd like to say that at this point, uh, I'm going to turn it back to the chair, and I think we're going to hear from Assistant General Manager Lee to talk a little bit about the RCI, which is the reason that uh, we're here tonight. Thank you, Mr. Kazim. Um, next, we're going to hear um, from Assistant General Manager. Pardon me, Chair Risk. Uh, I think next on the this is Michael Jones, Deputy General Manager. I think next on the agenda is public comment. Oh, uh, you're you're correct. I'm sorry about that. So, in keeping with um, our comments about the the importance of um, public comment, we are going to turn to public comment. Um, for those who are calling in, um, there's a process, and I'm going to turn it over um, to the, the district secretary to manage the process of bringing in speakers. Um, I think, how many speakers do we have at the moment, uh, District Secretary? Well, well, right now we've only got one hand raised, but there are actually 62 people who are attending this meeting um, who may wish to speak. Uh, so at this point, if you would li like to make a public comment, please raise your hand so we can get an accurate count of how many people there are out there who want to make a, a comment. So, and how do, we, how do we raise our hand? By dialing, uh, it's, it's star nine. Star Raise nine on the phone, and the the point of this is to give as um, commenters as much time as possible within reason, given the number of callers that we've got online. And at this point, we have three people who have raised their hand, so um, we are prepared to set the limit at as you please. Yes. Yeah, so it, with only that 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 few commenters, let's do three minutes. Okay, so we'll have three minutes, and um, I will unmute the people. Uh, now we have four. <laughs> okay, so the person who's just been unmuted, please uh, identify yourself and make your comments. Uh, yes, this is uh, Uncle Bobby, of course, Oscar Grant's uncle. Um, you know, like to take a few minutes to talk about uh, what we're speaking about. And that is, I want us to always remember, um, in 1992, James Durrell Hall, as you know, uh, was killed by a bar police officer in Hayward. And the officer that killed him, Officer C Crabtree, committed suicide, you know, so that raised the question of whether what he stated at that time was correct or not. And of course, many of us believe that when Gerald Hall was shot in the back of the head, that of course there was no justification for that officer to kill him the way that he did. And that may be why he committed suicide. But let me move on. Robert Greer in 1997 was in a mental state crisis, was killed in police custody. In 2001, Bruce Edward Stewart was killed in Hayward. He too was in a mental state crisis, was naked and unconscious when he was awoken by a police, uh, BART police officer and then eventually, of course, killed. Of course, 2009, my nephew Oscar Grant was wrongfully killed. You know, no need for me to go into the details of that, but we're clear of what happened. 2010, Fred Collins killed at the Fruitvale BART station in a mental state crisis. It's alleged that he yelled to the officers many times, shoot me, shoot me, wanting to die by suicide by police. That's a mental state crisis. Charles Blair Hill, Civic Center, 
2011, another young man uh, in a mental state crisis, as we know, was killed by BART police. James Nate Greer, 2014, at the Hayward Station, 10 officers on top of him. The reason why he was stopped because he was goofily driving. Maybe he was intoxicated, maybe he wasn't, but at the same time, it still was a mental crisis stasis that uh, a mental crisis, a mental crisis state that he was in, and yet he was killed. Now, of course, we could talk about Bar's very own Tommy Smith and what happened to him, and the fact that he requested to be trained, and the Bart chief, uh, I forget who it was exactly, refused to allow him to be trained in how to search a building or a house that they may go in and as a result, he was killed. And we know that all these killings amounted to a lot of money being paid out to the families for being murdered. So I want us to always remember as we go ahead and talk about, you know, making BART a better, making BART police department a better place to think about how important it is that we have crisis intervention training, not so much that, but a, and an auxiliary board that may be responsible for mental health or mental crisis state situations. And I believe too, another part that should be considered is the decertification of certain police officers according to their history so that they can't just go to another BART or another agency and be rehired. I wanted to put that out there so that as we think about how to make you know, I think ultimately the goal is to how to make BART police department better equipped, not better equipped, but better able to handle situations, especially when it's the state of someone being in a crisis that they can live rather than be killed. So we have a history of BART killing people in a mental state crisis. You know, the evidence are there, the history is there. So it's much for us to think about how we should do this. And definitely those officers that act in bad conduct should be definitely decertified. I'm going to conclude right there. Thank you for that comment, Uncle Bobby. Let's have the next public comment. Um, we understand that Wanda Johnson wants to speak, so I'm looking for her phone number right now. Um, Ms. Great. Johnson, if you could raise your hand. That would help by hitting star nine. Um, otherwise, I am searching it for your phone number in the list. I do not see it. Um, so that being the case, we'll just we'll move on to the next person. And Ms. Johnson, uh, we'll give you a, a chance after the next person speaks. Great. To the person who's just been unmuted, please identify yourself. And uh, yes, hi. This is uh, Nick Carraway. Yes, you have three minutes, Mr. Carraway. Okay, hi. I live in BART D4. I'm calling to insist that you staff the BART Police Department in accordance with the 2018 University of North Texas study, the five-year strategic patrol staffing plan commissioned for and paid for by BART. In the era of defund the police, it is critical that we do not throw the proverbial baby out with the bathwater and haphazardly defund all police departments, including the BART Police Department, which has undergone a decade of reform and has instituted all of the post-Floyd reform activists have dem uh, demanded across the country. These features include an office of the independent police officer, a citizen review board, and numerous commitments to progressive policing. We live in a very polarized time and location regarding law enforcement, as there is a very loud contingent in the Bay Area that openly hates police officers, consistently denigrates and verbally abuses the men and women who wake up every day to work a thankless job in a department that is understaffed and overworked because this BART board refuses to hire additional officers to staff its credentialed and reform centric force. Let's not be stereotypical and slander or punish the BPD for the actions 
of the officers involved in the Floyd death and other deaths across the country in locations that are not as progressive as the Bay Area. When we make decisions as to how we govern, let's look at the crimes against persons data and not legislate out of fear or according to stereotypes. Let's remove our personal biases against law enforcement. Crimes against person on, persons on BART are surging. That's what the number shows. Rapes, homicides, aggravated assaults, and thefts. BART needs more sworn officers to increase the police officer presence across this currently troubled system. I am deeply disturbed by the arrogance of this board and those who casually denigrate the men and women of the BPD whose job it is to babysit the mess of crime and drugs sanctioned by the enlightened progressive governments of San Francisco, California, and Berkeley. Let's remember that police officers are human beings with families to go home to and just want to do their job and make it home safe. Support them by hiring additional officers to fight the surging crime that is perpetuating the demise of BART ridership. Staff the BART Police Department, according to the 2018 academic study commissioned by BART from the University of North Texas, the five-year strategic patrol staffing plan. We are in uncharted waters. If Trump is elected to a second term, which is very, very, very possible, we may see four more years of unprecedented chaos and anarchy with no protection for the law-abiding citizens because you've cut the police. Mr. This Chairway, is not the time, up. nor the department. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that comment. Let's have the next comment. Hello? Yes. Hello. Please okay. announce your name and you have three minutes. Thank you. Thank you. My name is my Sharon name is and I am very concerned that the um, CRV is responding. Can you hear me? Please give some direction to the caller about either taking herself off of her cell phone or, or um, it seems like you have two different um, modes that you're entering and we, we just get a call back. I mean, we're getting a lot of feedback and we want to hear you. I apologize for butting in. Yeah, if you could, if you could turn off uh, if you have a computer on that's replaying the meeting or any, any other thing and just speak into your phone better, and we'll give you again a fresh three minutes. Right, so um, we'll give her a chance to call back in, or not to call back in, but to speak again. I am not Does sure which work? number she's on. Are you still there? Does this work? Yes, I am here. Much better. Okay, go ahead. Please start over. Thank you very much. My name is Karen, and I am a citizen of Oakley, California, and I am a writer of BART. I'm very concerned that the CRB is responding to a mob request and not to voters. There are many people in the Bay Area who have been silent because they have not been protesting or, or demonstrating because they're concerned about COVID. And I think this is an unfair um, standard to say that we're, the, the CRB is going to listen to a mob that started in Minneapolis based on the policing in that area, which is completely different from the policing here. Um, the police overwhelmingly make BART safer. I feel safer when I ride BART and see a police officer I see that when there are uh, demonstrations and there are riots, the police actually are full of restraint and they are diverse. This is not an issue with our BART police. Um, there will always be a risk of violence in our society. That is what we have the police for. I cannot imagine how an ambassador who is unarmed and not able to use all the tools in their tool belt in case it's needed would make anything safer. Um, I feel that more innocent people would actually be hurt if you remove the, the actual use of a potential use of force, even if they don't end up using it, that they should have that ability. Um, has the board considered how many over, um, uh, overdoses or drug uses and homeless people have actually caused violence when asked to stop their illegal activity? 
Do you think that they would actually just move on and, and get out of the BART system? Or do you think that they would confront people who were unarmed and had no actual authority? Um, BART PD also has excellent training. I echo the things from the last caller who said, you know, mentioned that there were all of these changes that happened with BART PD since the Oscar Grant incident. And there is a lot of training that goes on, especially in California. California has one of the best areas for training in police, and, and especially with BART. Um, and I just encourage the BART CRB to not have a knee-jerk reaction to something for um, far removed from what BART is actually doing. I think BART only needs more police. They are understaffed, overworked, and their training is excellent. Let's keep that up. Let's put money into the training of these highly qualified officers who are ready to serve us. Otherwise, we won't have anyone who's willing to be put into those positions when they're being denigrated and, um, and harassed by their own citizen review board, by their own board of directors. It is ridiculous to think that people want to abolish or defund police in this age of anarchy and chaos. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for that comment. Let's do the next comment. Mr. Patelis. Yes, I'm here. All right, can you, can you, uh, turn off any computer that you might have on or any other um, any other feedback mechanism that you might be having so that we can hear you clearly. Okay, I'll try to unmute him again. Are you there, sir? Hello, I'm here. I need to turn oh, off any other recording um, or, or um, speaker systems that you might have on so that we don't get a feedback. We're hearing an overwhelming feedback from you. Can you go ahead and try again? Michael Petrellis, and I'm not. Okay. I'm sorry, Mr. Petrellis. Mr. Secretary and, and Chair, is, is that feedback, it's definitely, is it, is it coming from the district or is it the caller in? I just want to make sure that we. Well, when I unmute him is when we get the feedback. It's I hear. not okay. there until I unmute him. Okay. Mr. Petrellis, can you try, if there is any computer that's, that's playing the meeting or any other phone that you have or, um, uh, or any recording of the meeting, can you make sure that that's turned off and you're only on the phone listening to us and speaking? Let's try one more time. Right. Okay. Hello. Okay. No, I, I'm sorry, we'll have to go on to the next speaker. Um, and so our next speaker is going to be Wanda Johnson. Okay. I can't unmute her. Ms. Johnson, if you could confirm on your end that you want to be unmuted, uh, you're unmuted on our end. There you go. Good afternoon. Hi, this is Wanda Johnson, the mother of Oscar Grant. The caller uh, before me, or before the call that you couldn't um, hold on, was uh, saying about the incident, which we need to call it what it was, Oscar was murdered. Um, that's the first thing I want to say. Since 2009, there have been some reforms made by BART, by the police officers. However, we still need to understand what police officers was hired for. They're hired to 
protect and serve. They're, they are being charged with doing jobs that they are not experienced and do not have the expertise in. We need to look at alternative ways if it requires defunding the police to allocate funds to go in different areas of BART by having some mental health experts available, by having um, funds directed to uh, the homeless and the those who are using drugs, to be able to get them diverted in, into the programs that they need to be put in. Um, by all means, I, I've heard callers say how the community hates the police. It is not that the community hates the police. What the community hates is those apples that are in the police force that are rotten. Let's really face it and look at the design of the police force. And we know from before Jim Crow laws what the police force was built upon. And if you look at history, you'll see that in policing, in times of slavery, and even before slavery, police officers were used to water hose civilians, African Americans. They were used to hang African Americans. They were used to get their dogs to attack African Americans. And so when we look at policing today, some of those same traits are in some of the police officers because it has been a history of racial uh, discrimination when it came to African American people, okay? You must understand the police system has been uh, designed and doing what it has been created to do. And so what we're asking, many of the public is asking in defunding the police is to begin to reallocate some of those funds to a specialist who have been trained in the field to assist those who need assisting. When you send a police to a person who ha is having a mental illness breakdown, the police's job and mindset is what they're trained to do is shoot to kill in center mass. That's what they're trained to do. And that's their process of thinking when they go into those situations to eliminate the target. And so we must come up with a way to reduce the interactions that turn fatal with bar police as well as community policing, the OPD um, and other police offices. Um, and so what we're requesting and what begin to look at how we're funding the police and begin to allocate some of those funds into programs that can improve the BART ridership by not having some of the uh, riders be scared to get on BART because of the people that's dealing with mental health, walking around, talking to themselves, walking around, taking their clothes off, walking around, doing a number of other things. And through the mental health uh, advocates uh, or specialists or psychiatrists that can be called for these uh, type of calls, it can help to eliminate some of those people by getting the people the proper help that we they need. Um, it, it, if you look at the history, and I know my time is running up, but if you look at the history and really think about it, we have put police officers in a bad position. We put them in a We are asking them to do jobs they have not been trained to do. And it's unfair to the public, and it's unfair to policing. And so we have to come up with uh, eliminate the position as well as the public having to be put in this position. And so I want to just really emphasize the need for even greater reform to work with training officers in going in and talking about the racial inequalities, talking about even from hiring practices on, increasing the number of minorities that are on the force um, to the increasing 
of hard train in the special fields to be able to come in and assist when needed to assist when there are types of calls that warrant their assistance. Um, there has to be a community effort where BART and the community will come together and look at the data that uh, has been passed down from the years since 2009 and begin to uh, work on decreasing those type of calls that they may have received from uh, the BART uh, operators in dealing with the patients who have mental health issues um, from even eating on the platform. So there has to be a way where that stigma can change because when we begin to improve the racial divide where police are stopping minorities versus Caucasians um, when they're eating, the racial divide when police are killing uh, minorities versus Caucasians at a higher rate, where police are writing tickets to minorities uh, at a higher rate than those uh, Caucasians at, in the BART area. And so we have to look at the training for anti-bias training and then work to get those seeds off the force that show the prejudice and replace them with those who are going to do a job that they've been hired to do and not do it because of what they heard or the uh, race interaction because of a certain minority group. Um, I, again, uh, for you to really look at some of the funds to go into the mental health, the homelessness, and the addiction uh, pool to help eliminate people's writers from being scared to write BART and helping the writers who need help with writing BART or meet, meet the mental health Ms. Johnson, Johnson? cut out there. Um, are you still there? You've run out of your yes, time. I am. Is there anything you else you wanted to say in conclusion? I appreciate your public comment. I just wanted to say, you know, and I think I was on the last meeting, to wreck, we have to be forth and what happened? You're, you're cutting out, Ms. Johnson, and we can't hear you. Um, um, are you there? Give me one second. Yes, I am. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. When we begin to recognize that there is an issue and we begin to take action on that issue, that's when we're going to see the change. When we recognize that, that we have put the police in a position where we are using them as uh, mental health experts when they are hired and they're trained to shoot to kill, and I continue to revert that because it was testif test testified by the officer that they're hired to train to shoot to kill. They're not hired. They're not there to try to talk someone out of uh, a mental illness breakdown. And so until we get the right people in the right positions, we're, you're going to have people such as myself making these same type of comments. Yes, you will have BART ridership uh, increase. When you have the proper people in place to 
work in the areas where they need to work to improve the BART ridership by working with those who have mental illness, by working with those who have drug problems, and calling those people out to try to um, change how the situation has uh, been handled in years past, meaning change by not killing that person, but by working with a mental expert, allowing that per- mental expert to try to talk to that person, to get that mental expert to that mental person to the hospital where they need to be at and not into the cemetery. I think, I think we hear you on that and I appreciate your public comment um, and we hope that you'll continue to attend. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. Um, thank you for that comment. Let's have the next uh, comment, Ms. Williams. Mr. Kunzler, when you're ready, go ahead and announce yourself and you have three minutes. Sure. Phil Kunzel here. I'm not going to need three minutes because I've got dinner waiting. But what I would encourage your bodies to do is balance the need between law enforcement, real, you know, and a presence of safety. And I think having more ambassadors who are armed with only a radio and maybe mace on every train would provide a presence to deal with the drug users and the people who abuse the public resource and have the cops there for the more serious stuff. Um, I think having a balance is important. I think making sure that you're anti-racist and fighting any racial bias or gender bias is important. Um, but I think at the end of the day, you need to support law enforcement or people are going to not ride the transit, period. Because if it's unsafe and they'll see it on social media, game over. You can have you can you can Xerox Lisa Trust 20 times and you will still have that problem. So you need to back the cops. That doesn't mean give them a blank check. Backing the cops to me means correcting them when they're wrong also. And let me be clear. What happened to Oscar Grant was tragic and the perpetrator was rightfully punished. Black lives matter. Cops lives matter. Transit riders lives matter. Thank you for listening. Thank you for that comment, Mr. Kunzler. Uh, let's have the next comment. Okay. Hi. It's been unmuted. Please announce your name and you have three minutes. My name is Gigi Gamble. I'm going to say that. I'm going to read some things that I wrote and be pretty quick. Um, I'm a station agent, and we don't really have the staff to address the kind of situations that can come up. Um, Our only choices are to handle things ourselves, which we usually do pretty well, I think. And if we can't handle something, then we can call for BART police. As other callers have said, police are being asked to handle stuff that really they shouldn't have to deal with. Um, specifically mental health issues and substance abuse problems. So I wish that we could allocate funds that we use for policing, allocate them towards other things like mental health care. And this is how I see it. I just want the Bay Area counties that use BART to work together with BART to resolve the conditions that make our stations fill in the funding gap in the Bay Area's overall health care and housing program. The reason why we're dealing with some of our issues is because people aren't getting the care that they need outside of the BART station, as well as problems with racism and classism in our society. We have these other issues. So anyway, thanks. That's all I wanted to say. Thank Thank you for the comment. Let's have the next public comment. You've just been unmuted. Please announce your name and you'll have three minutes. 
Hi there. Uh, this is Patrick Mortier, and I'm in uh, District 9 here. Um, I just want to say that I agree with the last caller, the station agent, as well as uh, Wanda Johnson. I think they put it perfectly, the situation that Bart's dealing with. Um, so I've participated in implicit bias trainings and, and law enforcement trainings with the Orlando Police Department, the Austin Police Department, as well as the Fresno Police Department here in California. Um, and I've also participated in shoot, don't shoot scenarios in Atlanta. Uh, I've attended law enforcement conferences in California, and I've bared witness to um, fallen officer ceremonies as well. So I do think I'm coming from a place of reputability when I say that the police, BART police, are not equipped to deal with the issues that BART is facing today. Um, you know, you can train your officers on implicit bias every day of the week, but there's not enough empirical evidence even then to show that these trainings are effective. Um, I just think that some of the people that have been calling saying that we need to throw more money into bar police are essentially the same folks that want to criminalize homelessness, criminalize those in distress, those who are suffering from mental health issues. And I think what's most important right now, first and foremost, is that you cannot arrest your way out of something that needs evidence-based methods of prevention, right? It requires investing more in homeless outreach programs and services. And I think it's important that BART does have coverage. Um, as a previous caller has said, having ambassadors on board in uniform with a radio and perhaps some mace is the most appropriate deterrent that BART can provide at this time. Um, people are, are they're afraid of law enforcement at this point. They're, they're um, bothered by the sight of firearms. And I think it's important that we have unarmed ambassadors on board providing more coverage on trains and being a resource, not just to people who are, who are undergoing mental health distress, uh, but also just uh, plain folks who, who want to feel like they can approach somebody on BART and ask for help. Um, but I do think it's important that we do have police on hand for serious calls, um, but that calls for mental health, distress, substance use, which I do think make up a bulk of the complaints that BART faces, do not require law enforcement intervention and interaction. Um, so I would hope that, that the BART Board of Directors looks more closely at, at the role of police, um, the, the money that the police are spending, um, which I can't find too much information on. And, um, and yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm encouraged by this conversation. I think that, you know, over the next few weeks and months, um, we, can, we can change the way that we view BART uh, police in this role. Thank you. Thanks for that comment. How many more do we have, Ms. Williams? Uh, we have four more. I have just unmuted the next one. Please announce your name, and you have three minutes. Hello? Yes, go Can ahead. you hear me? Yes. Hello. Uh, this is Michael Petrellis calling in again. I uh, tried before and was unable to um, uh, be heard, and I am now on my landline with my um, stopwatch going, so I know when I'll be up with three minutes. Again, my name is Michael Petrellis, and I am a candidate for the um, BART Board District 9 seat. I'll be on the ballot this November. Um, I would like to advocate for defunding the BART police. I believe it's very important to have a discussion about defunding the BART Police Department and redirecting that money into um, other programs within the BART system. I would also like to address the matter of um, uh, the murder of Oscar Grant and a previous caller alleging that um, his killer, Johannes Messerly, had served enough time and had been adequately pu uh, punished. That is simply not true. Johannes Messerly was sentenced to only two years in the penitentiary, two years for murdering Oscar Grant, and then because of good behavior and time in custody while waiting for trial, Johannes Messerly was let out of jail after serving about a year. So I do not really want to hear any discussion that um, in the murder of Oscar Grant that justice was served. 
a two-year sentence and only one year of actual time in custody is not justice. And I think that um, points to uh, the discussion I would like the BART board to have about defunding the police department. If and when we defund your police department, that uh, money saved can be redirected into expanding the ambassadors, the unarmed ambassadors. I would also like um, licensed social workers to be working with the ambassadors on properly handling the situation when BART riders are experiencing mental or drug problems. And I will conclude uh, by saying it is also time for the BART board to uh, keep minutes that accurately reflect what we say during public comment, because right now your policy is you will only state our names and you will give no summary of our actual statements. That needs to change. Thank you. Thank you for that comment. Uh, the next caller, Ms. Williams. Hi, this is David Long. I think I've been unmuted. Can you confirm that you can hear me? Yes, go ahead. Uh, I would just like to uh, say that I uh, fully agree with Ms. Johnson's statements who called in earlier um, and also find it really heartening that uh, one of the station agents called in and gave such thoughtful um, comment. Uh, I'd like to use my time to echo what they said. Uh, I do not think that BART police uh, are equipped to handle the problems that BART is facing at this moment, and I strongly support efforts uh, not only to reform BART police, but to take more bold steps to defund and allocate resources towards uh, more meaningful uh, and real solutions. Uh, I look forward to seeing progress in this work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay, so my name is Dan. Um, I've been to a lot of meetings, and I want to say that everyone here has said some of the most intelligent um, things about what needs to be done with BART police. I'm, I'm more on the side. I don't really think BART police need to be defunded because, in my opinion, they, they've been struggling for quite a long time. Other elements of the BART system might. The sad thing is, though, it, right now is a pretty hard time to talk about money, especially in the context of BART and maybe starting a new program. Some things that I think can happen um, the ambassadors, the ambassador, well, two things. First, when you call 510-464-7000 uh, or you get transferred by a station agent or whatever, um, the person who picks up, you know, they identify themselves as, a, as with BART police. What I really think BART needs to do is have a central line where people can call for m m d uh, several different issues. Like you call a number and ask what, what's going on. You know, you could push one for police, two for the biohazard issue. We'll prioritize the calls based on that and maybe have some options for drug use or mental health issues. Because certain things, someone, you know, someone um, on, a, on a train smoking, smoking pot, you know, that, that's not okay, especially if you're, you know, stuck in the car. But you, if you're on the phone with the BART police, the dispatcher, you could be holding up someone that's in the trackway ready to kill themselves. So... The issues of BART police having too many responsibilities, not and sometimes just not even the right ones, it beyond it goes beyond just the individual officers. Also, the uh, ambassadors. I'll be honest; they're a little intimidating to me sometimes. I want to have people I can go up to. Um, they honestly look like cops from far away, and it, it, the way they have their duty belt, I, I, I think it's a little intimidating. Um, but I like where this is going. Um, and again, it's, it, this is a really hard time, especially for BART, to be talking about money. 
uh, and things. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for calling. I appreciate that. Let's see, do we have one or two more? Right, uh, one more. Uh, go ahead, you've been unmuted. Please give your name and you have three minutes. All right. Hi, my name is Kylie. I commute to work um, or used to commute to work pre-COVID um, every day to SF via BART. Um, I'm thinking that like instead of paying BART police to enforce fair evasion, then we should lower like defund the amount of money that BART police have and instead fund uh, fair free ridership programs. Um, I know that there is a, I think, 20% um, decrease in fare for those that 200% are below the poverty line. But honestly, like, that that should just be zero. Like, come on. Like, that's just ridiculous. Um, especially when bar police, they're known to be, like, targeting Black people and Black riders. Like, uh, bar ridership is just 10% Black, but, like, 50% of all BPT um, uses of force are targeted against black riders and nearly 50% of like fair evasion citations are issued to black riders. Um, the only time I've ever seen BART police when I'm on my commute <clears throat> is when they're harassing homeless people inside the BART stations or standing like threateningly near the BART exits. Um, I was on a car one time where I saw um, one man falsely claimed that a homeless man had threatened him with scissors. Uh, nobody else had seen this happen. And a BART cop was on the train within like two to three stops. Um, even though the cop asked everyone on the train, like, hey, did anybody see this happen? Everyone said no. But then that homeless man still had to get off of the train with the cop so the man could file a complaint against him, which something probably didn't even fucking happen. Um, the point of all this being is just that homeless people are criminalized by these callers who use the bar cops to their advantage to target people they deem that are unfit for society when this is the fucking society that we've created. We've created a society that fucking criminalizes black people, homeless people, and the police are enforcers of the society, the system, and not a part of the solution. I don't want racists to feel emboldened to cowardly report lies, knowing that the police are on their side when they step into the bar car. If that guy didn't call the cops, the homeless man would have been to his destination without any incident. Um, I think that we maybe need some signage on BART to remind people that just because homeless people or mental illness make you uncomfortable, it's not a reason to call the cops. Um, you think about all the incidents that have happened, obviously Oscar Grant, but you remember Officer David McCormick, who um, was harassing a black man for eating on the platform. Um, I don't know what happened to that officer, but I hope he got fired because, like, his ego and power shipping were ridiculous. And then um, I also remember when it took police hell along to finally catch the guy who was targeting black women. People were, like, scared to, to ride BART. And that's the time that the police were needed. Um, but the guy that killed Mia Wilson and stabbed her sister before getting caught. So I don't know. Tell me who the police are for. Um they respond in like two to three stops for a homeless man, but not for a killer. So, uh, yeah, I think that they need to be defunded. They need to start talk stop targeting um, black people. And we need people to protect us from white supremacists, but the police aren't going to do that. They're not going to protect us from themselves. The police only protect white interests and property. Every person killed by BPD in the last 30 years has been either black, mentally ill, or homeless. Um, and we need to defund BPD, and we need to make more fare-free um, programs for riders. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that comment. Um, do we have any more comments? That is well? the last one. Okay. All right. Um, I want to thank everybody who made public comments. I want to encourage you um, to come to future meetings. As I said at the beginning, this will not be the only meeting on this subject. Um, and we need your help. So please come to our meetings, speak to me or your representatives on the BART uh, Board of Directors or the CRB individually, um, and so that you can be heard. Okay, the next, uh, we're moving on to the fourth agenda item, um, which um, we're gonna begin with an explanation, a short summary of um, the roll call introduction. That's like a, a, a measure, a 
a motion that's been made um, by the board of directors earlier this summer. And it's gonna be explained to us uh, by Assistant General Manager Rod Lee, who manages external affairs for BART within the general manager's office. Mr. Lee. Board meeting. The agenda contains an item entitled roll call for introduction or abbreviated as RCI. The RCI item is when each director is allowed to introduce a matter for consideration at a future committee for board meeting. As the chair mentioned earlier this summer, uh, actually on June 25th, at the board meeting, Director Rebecca Saltzman introduced the RCI that's posted on the screen. I will read it aloud now for those who are on the phone. In response to Black Lives Matter, the tragic murder of George Floyd by Minneapolis police, Bay Area social justice protest and public demand, the board of directors requests that the general manager work with the board of directors on an immediate stakeholder process to develop changes to the BART police model that de-emphasizes the use of sworn personnel to respond to homelessness, behavioral health, and substance use, among other issues that do not need an armed police response. Recognizing that much has been done to implement progressive and equitable policing practices, we also need to consider a different model of public safety that is more effective and prevents racially biased policing. The goal is to have recommendations for consideration in October when the board considers revisions to this year's budget. As mentioned by the general manager at the, outside, at the outset of the meeting, we have deliberately begun the stakeholder engagement process with the BPCRB to, to, due to your important role. We are seeking your input on recommendations that shall inform the BART board. Staff is developing a comprehensive list of diverse internal and external stakeholders with whom to conduct facilitated discussions and acquire their recommendations. We will seek input from each of the board of directors to ensure our stakeholder engagement process is inclusive and representative of the communities we serve. I'll pass it back to the chair now. Thank you, Mr. Lee. Okay, now I'm gonna give a very brief um, overview of the BART police oversight model for context and firm information um, because uh, not everybody on the call is familiar with it. Um, so our civilian uh, oversight model was created after Oscar Grant's death in 2009. Um, and you can find the governing document called the model easily online by searching BART Police Civilian Oversight Model. And I encourage everyone to take a look at it if you aren't familiar. It's pretty short, it's about a little over 10 pages. Um, at a high level, the model is designed to um, promote integrity and encourage system, systemic change in and improvement in the police services that BART provides to the public. That's what the model says. Um, it's to identify deficiencies, make sure they're appropriately addressed, including racial profiling and allegations of racially abusive treatment. Um, to do this, the, the model basically creates two bodies, uh, this board, the CRB, and the Office of the Independent Police Auditor. The Office of the Independent Police Auditor, um, who's uh, now, now, sir, uh, now Russell Bloom, is appointed uh, by the Board of Directors. OIPA has a limited but growing staff, and it has a number of very important responsibilities in our system. Um, first, OIPA is always available to receive complaints about BART, BART police. Uh, it in investigates them uh, separately from internal affairs and it makes findings and recommendations where there are allegations of misconduct. Um, OIPA bring these, brings these cases to the CRB. It presents its investigations in closed um, uh, proceedings. And this board votes to um, recommend uh, disciplinary resolutions to the chief. It's up to the chief to impose discipline. Um, and if there's disagreement between the OIPA and CRB um, or, and the chief, uh, the dispute can be escalated to the general manager and the board of directors. And this entire process, importantly, it, it exists independently from internal affairs. Um, second, OIPA is also empowered to make police uh, policy recommendations to the chief. Um, so for example, in recent years, o OIPA has made changes or recommended changes to the body cam policy and the policy concerning aggressive panhandling. The Citizen Review Board can do the same and we've done so recently in regards 
um, to the use of force policy, transgender policy, and other policies. And again, ultimately, it's up to, to the chief to make these, implement these policy recommendations, and disputes can be escalated to the general ma manager of the board. Um, third, and newly and importantly, OIPA has significant auditing and review powers. It can review legal claims and lawsuits brought against BART PD and make recommendations out of those. It can review internal affair disciplinary cases. It reviews use of force incidents and monitors uh, the police department's internal review processes to make sure that misconduct matters are thoroughly and fairly addressed. Um, OIPA, OIPA can generally audit BPD files um, related to investigations concerning the quality of police services. And OIPA um, responds to scenes of critical incidents such as shootings to monitor the investigation separately from the police department. Um, finally, like, like CRB, OIPA is also um, charged with performing public outreach um, to improve relationships between the, pub, um, the district and the police department and the public and to educate the public about the oversight system here at BART. Um, the second body that the model creates is this board. Uh, CRB is primarily um, consists of uh, members appointed by the board of directors. So I'm appointed by Janice Lee to represent a por portion of San Francisco. We have 10 such re um, reps plus one member who's appointed uh, jointly by the management and officers unions, as well as a public art large member who's appointed by the board and is in this case, um, my vice chair, Aaron Armstrong. We serve two years, we're volunteers, and we've got no staff support. We do this work because we believe it's important as a public service. Um, and we hold monthly meetings where we discuss ongoing oversight matters. Um, and those meetings are open to the public, of course. As I mentioned, CRB also plays a role in hearing disciplinary cases. Uh, OIPA presents its investigations to us in closed session, and we make uh, recommendations that are forwarded to the chief. Um, again, if there are disputes, these can be escalated to the GM and the board of uh, directors. We do not have a final say in discipline. Um, like, like OIPA, uh, we can also make recommendations about policies, and uh, the department's obligated to bring policies to us for review. Um, and third, we are like the OIPA also empowered uh, to conduct uh, public outreach and educate the community about our oversight system and ensure public trust. Um, I want to remind you that I've, uh, to look at the, the model, I've spared you many more details um, and uh, it's only about 10 pages. Um, all right. So that's the model as it currently exists. Um, we're gonna, I'm gonna turn it over to Mr. Kazmir to facilitate comments um, from the CRB. Um, and I wanna um, remind the members respectfully, we're, we're doing well on time, but um, because of everybody uh, here wants to be heard, um, please be mindful of the time and I'll, um, I will prod you if I feel uh, that you're um, overriding your the limits. Uh, Mr. Kazimir, do you want to take it from here? Certainly. Thank you very much. And it is time now for the board of directors and folks listening in, in this meeting to hear from the PCRB members. So now is your opportunity. I have a listing of members. I will go down the list methodically and, uh, and ask you to make your comments. So I'd like to start with uh, Chairperson Risk. Would you like to start this comment? Um, if you don't mind, I'd like to hear from my other board members first, and maybe if I have anything to add, I'll um, do so at the end. Very good. Thank you very much. We'll go with uh, Bill White. Uh, thank you, <coughs> members. I'm going to uh, uh, try to um, walk a very narrow path here because um, I've been with uh, police oversight for since 1996, started in, starting in Berkeley and moving my way up to BART. And I was one of the uh, um, people along with uh, Mr. Kashmir who sat and tried to, um, or who had come up with the development of this particular board. <laughs> the reason I'm saying that um, I'm walking a narrow strip here is because I've had a lot of experience in police oversight. And I have had a lot of experience in dealing with uh, the mental health uh, um, industry. I am um, 
also a board member of BART, um, I'm BOSS, I'm sorry, BOSS, Building Opportunities for Self-Sufficiency. Um, that's an organization that helps indigent people uh, navigate um, through this uh, through this life um, who have um, uh, homeless problems or mental problems. Um, I'm going to defer to that experience in terms of uh, what I have seen over the years. I've been with BOSS for almost as long as I've been with, in police oversight. I've been to um, to um, mental health facilities such as John George in Hayward. And I've seen um, the behavior uh, of um, people in crisis. And I've seen the reaction of the staff to these people in crisis. And sometimes it wasn't very pretty. I, I can tell you, it wasn't very pretty. In Berkeley, um, we have had a um, situation or a number of uh, cases where there have been um, uh, a group of, uh, of people from the mental health industry try to, trying to work with this, the, the um, police department there. There is, just a non, there is just not enough staff in the mental health industry in the Bay Area to cover all of the needs that the Bay Area needs in, in mental health. And for us to say that we need people of this, of this background to be, um, to take over police work in BART is really um, short-sightedness because there's just not enough people. Um, There is another elephant in the room that I think needs to be addressed in terms of bad police officers. And the elephant is the police union. I'm often frustrated with the police union defending bad police officers, blindly defending them. If any reform should come, it should be blindly defending them. Sorry. If any, if there is any uh, reform, it should be a if any reform reform of. Hmm. Getting a little Hunter. feedback, and so if we, if you can go back maybe thirty seconds and maybe try to start again. Okay. Um, and Mr. Bill, I want to remind you, you're about four minutes now, so okay, okay. Um, I don't want to rush you, but uh, just I'm, okay. I just I, I'm going to check this. Try to check. Okay. Anyway, um, we should be looking at some sort of reform with the police union in terms of getting a just system in place to get rid of bad officers. That's what has brought us here to today. Is a bad officer that took the life of Mr. Floyd. That officer should have never been on the force, and the, the unions knew how bad he was. Um, again, there's not enough trained uh, people in the mental health industry to take over this. Uh, uh, and um, I'm, and I'm okay, I do, I'm finished. You've uh, gone beyond your time, Mr. White. Thank you very much for your input. And there will be additional opportunities in the future for you to speak. But thank you very much for your input. Okay. Okay. Um, Christina Gomez. Hi, thank you. Um, so I, I want to, first of all, thank all of our, um, our public speakers, uh, those that have called in to to share their concerns, um, I I want to say that I'm I'm seeing that there's um, some things that are being conflated right now. One of those is this issue of um, homelessness, drug use, mental health, and overdosing being um, kind of skewed into this conversation around fair fair evasion. Um, 
I, I want to say that um, I want to make sure we're keeping those separate, knowing that both of them do overlap in, in different areas. Um, I bring this up to say that that this is this is not an issue of fair evasion. Um, this is an issue of um, utilizing police for addressing behavior issues, um, behavior health issues. And it brings up a couple of questions for me. Um, you know, has BART looked into uh, additional cities that have had partnerships between local counties in the way that they address um, issues of homelessness and substance abuse? Um, what platforms have we created for homeless advocates to provide input um, and discuss how they can potentially assist BART? We are a very social service rich um, count, you know, uh, multiple counties that make up the Bay Area. And I, I just wonder how much um, we are in constant communication with our local um, homeless services coordinators in each county and how we are um, we are partnering with them uh, to provide better access for our riders who are homeless who are struggling um, to access these services and I just don't think um, my assumption is is that we don't do enough talking my assumption is that um, there is areas for us to better coordinate with them and in regards to policing um, I, I want to believe that, I want to believe that the reason why we're utilizing, um, police officers to, or peace officers, BART peace officers to take on these, um, situations is because, um, we are clueless as to how to help them versus believing that we have, um, seen homelessness and mental health and drug use and overdosing as um, a crime in the system versus people reaching out for help. And so uh, I say that to say, I'm sorry, go ahead. Keep, keep going, you're at, oh. you're at three minutes. Sorry. No, yeah, I, I actually will stop there. I just wanna say that, um, that these questions that I ask I'm hoping that we can address, that we can find vehicles to coordinate with local county um, homeless directors. Um, every county has one uh, that oversees the services that a city provides or a county provides to uh, its, its homeless population. And I really want us to get better at coordinating with these um, counties. And even thinking about the different types of opportunities that we could potentially provide to make things a little bit easier for our BART riders to get to these services. Thank you Thank very you. much for your comments. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay, let's go now to Darren White. I don't think we have Darren White today, unfortunately. Okay, we'll pass and move to Aaron Armstrong. <coughs> thank you. Uh, yeah, and thank you. I'm here. Um, just have a few things that I want to say, and I'll try and be as concise and as possible. Um, to respond to some of the public comment that we were getting during item three, I want to start off by saying that it, this is not about defunding the police. Uh, this is about reimagining what policing means um, and making sure that we're doing it in a way that better serves the community. Um, so I want to just be very clear about what the goal is. Um, the way I see it, there are two ways that we can do this, uh, at least uh, from here. Um, one is by making sure that we have the right tool for the right job. We've heard a lot about that today. Uh, and the second that we can do is look at structural issues that are causing um, these types of situations to replay over and over and over again. Um, so I want to start off just quickly by, by talking about the, the first time when I joined the board. I thought it was very important to go on a ride along with BART police. I wanted to really understand what it was like day to day for their activities. What were they doing? Um, and I was actually quite surprised. The, all of, all of the contacts that they made that day were homeless individuals. 
Um, and it was all about uh, walking through the train, identifying people who were asleep on the train, waking them up and kicking them off the train. Um, I watched as an as a unhoused person, uh, a woman was woken up uh, and, and let off into the Fruitvale, my home station, uh, with no resources, no counseling on where to go. She didn't know where she was. Um, and to me, that was a tragedy. Um, I think that we shouldn't be, uh, that we need to re really think about what it means to be policing crimes of poverty, homelessness, fair evasion. Um, what does that look like? Because as one of the public comments correctly pointed out, police know one thing, and that is use of force. Um, and so when we're using police for these crimes of poverty, what does that mean? Um, and the second piece that I want to talk about just briefly is around the structural change and some of the structural elements that, that I've seen. Um, and I appreciate Mr. White's comments regarding the police union. I myself was uh, quite shocked when I found out that the police union had a voting seat on the citizen review board. Uh, this is the, the voice of the citizens, and yet the, the union has a voting seat. Um, and so this really plays right into the kind of power that they have and that they use. I remember when I first came to the CRB before joining it as a member, I was there to advocate for more compassionate policies on the detention of transgender individuals and um, really tried to push for, for some things that I believe in and got significant pushback from the police union to the point that some things didn't happen. Um, it's, um, I think that we need to continue to lead the way. As it's been pointed out many times, uh, BART Police has taken many steps, and BART as an organization has taken many steps over the last 10 plus years. Uh, we've led the way, and it's time to continue leading the way. Because reform isn't a destination, it's a journey. You don't get to a place and say, great, we've done it, uh, reform accomplished, it's a process. And we need to continue that process and continue that journey because that's where the work is. Thank you. Thank you very much for those comments. We appreciate those. Now we'd like to hear from uh, George Perez Velez. Myself. Um, thank you. Um, first of all, I want to thank everybody who spoke um, during um, public comment and acknowledge the presence of the members of the board. I have the great honor of representing the District 9 in San Francisco. As an employer in the city of San Francisco, 300, 400 employees at one time or the other who take part on a regular basis. I can tell you that my district is impacted by um, interactions with the police, whether they're positive or negative. I had a conversation with the organization Homie in, um, in the mission, which I'm sure Director Buff, Buff, um, Dufty is very well aware of. And the conversations were around safety and perception of safety from older uh, members of the community who think that the police presence is necessary for their safety when they come late from work to youth who think that the presence of the police is intimidating and creates fear. So we have to be very careful when we're having the discussions in understanding that there's two different dynamics of this conversation and that both needs to be addressed. Now we know, and I have to say that since I've been here with Mr. White from the beginning, that great changes have happened. And I was present as a chair when we're trying to do a transgender treatment, transgender individuals general order that Vice Chair Eric Armstrong spoke about. And we did have some pushback. Um, having said that, I'd rather just focus on things that we could do. We know that AB 392 is in place. We know that SB 230 will be in place as of January 2021. And we know now that we, there is a process by, um, by the creation of AB 1506, which be investigations of use of force for po police department, as well as possible criminalization of acts that are in excessive use of force, and Senator Skinner is working on SB 776 that, although not perfect, will address misconduct of police officers and how they are um, devoted to the public as we continue to see how do we not perpetuate the hiring of police officers from department to department. So I'll have to say that um, I, I would recommend, um, in addition to giving a kudos to um, board member Saltzman for the great recommendations on RCI 2832. In addition to that, the police review, the, the BART CRB needs to engage on creating a subcommittee in use of force policy 
to make sure that the department is in compliance with SB 230 and to go beyond the standard that we use on now minimum reliance to talk about objectively reasonable, objectively necessary, and proportional standard. I think that the, the, the district should engage in creating a possible creation of a rapid response team for a mental health crisis. I think that will go a long way about dividing those responsibilities. I think the department needs to train the, the 911 um, dispatchers because that communication between the dispatcher to the police officer is critical in how police officers respond to situations on, on, in the field. Um, and again, I will agree with the um, um, Vice Chair Amtrung. This is not about defunding the police. This is about re reassessing priorities and not criminalizing um, homelessness and poverty. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much for your comments. Mr. Kenneth Liu. Hi, Ken Liu here, District 1. I'll try to keep this kind of short, even though I think everyone's running a little long on time. Um, I pr pretty much, um, well, I, I want to say I'm probably the only person on this board who actually responds as a professional rescuer into some of the BART stations, uh, like those at Bay Point and stuff like that. And I will come to the same conclusion that almost every other board member and director has here, that we definitely have a homeless problem, behavioral issues problems in our stations. Uh, but my take is slightly different. I actually don't think this is a police issue um, so much as, or a policing issue so much as it is a lack of resources. Um, I've seen a lot of failed attempts at playing whack-a-mole with our problems. We have homeless outreach teams that are never at the right place at the right time when you need them. And it's not a problem of not having them. It's just not having enough of them. And so uh, I simply want to look at it as what's our role and what's our position. Uh, BART is a transit authority. We are the citizen review board that should be governing how policing happens within the BART district. And I kind of think that we need to re-examine, you know, and focus in specifically to what is our main purpose. I personally think our main purpose is to watch the safety and security of our passengers get from point A to point B. And when we look at homelessness, a lot of the problems that we have, even with the homeless outreach teams, is there are no resources for them. But I don't necessarily think this is a BART problem. I think this is a regional problem that has to be handled within the municipalities the BART also serves. Uh, when it comes down to it, at the end of the night when BART closes, we have homeless people at various BART stations that pretty much get exited out of uh, BART stations. We have nowhere to send them. There is no homeless um, shelters that accept people at 1, 2, 3 a.m. in the morning. And a lot of times that overburdens the EMS systems and the hospital systems. So I will say, yes, we do have a problem but I don't necessarily think it's a policing issue so much as it's a lack of regional resources. Uh, with that said, um, I thank you guys for your time and I thank all the people who made public comments earlier. Much appreciated. Thank you very much, Mr. Liu. Les Messinger. Looks to me like Les has temporarily left the, mess, the meeting. So if he comes back, why don't we circle up? Oh, Les, is that you? Don, Les, it looks like you're muted. Um, now's the time for public or for your comment. If you could unmute, unmute yourself. Okay, is Les uh, back? Why don't we come back to him? It looks like he's still getting um, set. Why don't we come back to him? Okay, let's do that. Uh, Zach Bruno, and again, if you have recommendations that you'd like to offer to the Board of Directors, we would like to hear those. Thank you very much. I uh, appreciate everybody's comments, and thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for all the members on the BART CRB um, and for the directors of the um, BART Board. This is a great meeting, and I uh, appreciate everybody's comments. I just have a few quick items to mention, and uh, I'm calling from the East Coast. It's almost nine o'clock here. I may have to go off the call in just a moment, but um, in my view, I would just say that uh, moving any resources away from sworn law enforcement officers would essentially be defunding them, and it doesn't really seem to me to have anything to do 
with police reform. Um, I think it just make the system more dangerous. And unfortunately, we've seen a significant rise in violent crime on BART, uh, as we've seen in the statistics month to month from 2015 to 2018, murder, rape, and robbery on BART have more than doubled from 234 incidents in 2015 to 481 incidents in 2018, um, one of the most recent years we have for a full year of statistics. And it seems to me that that would be a pretty terrible time to be taking resources away from law enforcement officers when a violent crime has been unfortunately increasing. Um, the police are the ones who respond first and have to evaluate a pretty wide variety of situations and there won't ever be another group that's capable of doing that in a timely fashion. The mentally ill, homeless, and uh, people with drug addictions, alcohol addictions, can create pretty dangerous situations for BART riders, and I think they shouldn't be taken lightly. Just three quick examples. Um, July 2018, John Lee Cowell, serial fare evader, murdered Nia Wilson. You probably remember reading about that attempted to murder her sister as well at the MacArthur Station. Uh, Wilson's family sued BART, alleging that had BART taken adequate measures to prevent ferry evaders from entering BART stations, platforms, and trains, then Nia Wilson would not have died. It was November of 2019 that a mentally ill man escaped from a hospital, uh, fare evaded onto BART, and he stabbed Oliver Williams to death on a train in Haywood. And in June 2020, a mentally ill woman wearing only her underwear, fair evaded into BART, pushed another passenger into the trackway in front of a train. And the passenger narrowly avoided getting run over by an oncoming train, and that was just a couple of months ago. You probably remember that pretty recently. Uh, and I would say it's pretty sad to think that these types of events are occurring, but uh, there are many more examples of this type of behavior on BART. Uh, I think it's great that BART police have undergone a long list of police reforms since 2009. And there is evidence that the reforms are working. Um, there have been zero sustained complaints for racial discrimination or bias against BART police officers. I'll say that again. There have been zero sustained complaints for racial discrimination or bias against BART officers. I think that's pretty remarkable, especially in light of the OIPA's diligent work. So the BPD should be seen as a success story of reform. I would also add that nobody hates a bad cop more than a good cop. And that goes for Understood. the police union. Thank you very much for your comments. Time's up. All right. Uh, just be sure that the riders of BART are able to have clean, safe, reliable transit. And I think having well-funded police would, would do that best. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much. We appreciate that. Uh, next up is uh, Todd Davis. Thank you um, for the opportunity to speak. And uh, I won't really have much to say. This is my second meeting. And uh, I'm surprised to actually have a meeting with the board of directors. So I'm impressed that they're that involved. And I appreciate all the people that spoke. I, I do want to make a comment, though, about the progress that apparently BART police has made. I appreciate the BART civilian review board. I appreciate the increase in training, but I think it's fair to note that with BART's own statistics, we see what I would call like an implicit or an explicit bias when it comes to citations for fare evasions, citations for eating and drinking, citations for smoking, use of force. I mean, we I know we haven't forgotten about Oscar Grant, but I'm sure we haven't forgot about Mr. Tyndall, who was um, shot only two years ago. And so I'm not here to suggest that we need to defund the police, but I, I am here to suggest that we do need to re-envision, okay, what we do with the money. And maybe we do need to apply it in areas where police are not as involved in those instances that can escalate to uses of force, fatalities, or to citations. May I also add that 
May also may add that African Americans, for some reason, although they, although they are only 10% of the ridership, roughly 10 to 12%, that somehow they're almost like 45% of the people barred from BART. Um, and these aren't my numbers. These are numbers that are released based on the statistics that the BART has given, you know, the public. And what strikes me is that, and maybe someone has said it, and maybe I just missed it. There were many speakers, but I was trying to listen as intently as I could. What strikes me is that even with the progress that we've made, I do not think that we have done enough as an agency and as now a new member of this review board to strike at the culture of our police department. If fair evasions and uses of force and barrings are focusing or disproportionately affecting a specific group, whether it's a group of color, ethnicity, religion, or what have you, then we need to get at the heart of that. If we know that uses of force are involving certain subsets like the homeless, then we need to get at the heart of that. And I'm hoping that this doesn't turn into a defund versus not defund, but this turns into how can we get at the source or the critical issues that would have a police officer focus on a person of color, that would have a police officer focus on someone homeless, and how do we resolve that issue? Because we're going to continually have Tyndall's. We're going to continue to have Appleton's. We're going to continue to have those instances where police officers are harassing people over sandwiches and drinking water. And if that doesn't stop, then really we've undermined our own efforts. Thank you again. Thank you. Appreciate your comments. Uh, let's go back to uh, Les Messinger. Are you on, Les? Les, you can unmute yourself by pressing star six on the phone. Okay, I'm not hearing from Les. Um, David Risk, would you like to uh, make comments at this point? Sure, I'll make a, just a few brief comments. Um, I strongly agree with um, the callers and my colleagues who have spoken about this effort in terms of transforming um, and reimagining public safety um, and the scope of police responsibilities. I do not want to see this devolve into a debate about defunding or de devaluing or abolishing police departments. I don't believe um, that's what this is about. Um, I also want to I want to echo one of the callers who urged upon us um, evidence-based reforms. I think it's so important um, that we look, that we collect more information and more data about what the police department is actually doing. Um, and I looked back uh, this fall at some of the police chief's monthly reports and I find um, that on average, roughly we have about 45 felony arrests a month, 125 misdemeanor arrests, 400 citation arrests, and um, hundreds and sometimes thousands of fair evasion and proof and payment um, contacts. The bulk of what we are doing with this department is very low level offenses. Um, only about 5% of them are felonies. And even of those, um, about half of those are service of warrants for conduct in so on some other occasion. So for, from my perspective, looking at the numbers, we can afford to refocus on the core um, public safety mission of the police department. And I believe we should be doing that in an evidence-based numbers um, focused way. Um, I also wanna say again that um, I think fair evasion and proof of payment is uh, an equity issue that we must look at in this effort. Um, we're gonna receive a report from the Center for Policing Equity. Um, that was a multi-year study of fair evasion at BART and the racial de demographics of it. And we're gonna, and we're gonna find um, that there are disparities in the way that um, fair enforcement uh, works. And, um, and the numbers already show that, you know, as, as Mr. Davis said, um, about 10% of our ridership is African American, and yet 50% of enforcement contacts are. Um, so I think we have to look at that. I also want to say that I hope that this um, process continues to be transparent. I think that's essential um, for public trust. I think it needs to continue to involve 
um, public input in the CRB. And then um, I want to just say a few things um, uh, in response to Mr. Bruno, um, who I respect, but uh, I think is confused about some of the data. Um, sustained complaints on bias, the fact that we don't have any is not, is not proof that we don't have bias in this department. Um, it's a it's a proof it's a proof issue um, and we could ask Russell about it but the standard of proof requires us to have objective evidence that usually requires a comment um, from from the officer one that's overheard um, we can we it's impossible to find that so as part of the structural changes um, to the model that I think we need to make we need to make changes to bias enforcement I support that I've been talking to Russell about it um, and secondly as I mentioned earlier um, although there have been tragedies over the years um, on the trains, which we're all acutely aware of, um, handpicking those incidents, I think, um, skews the picture and injects more emotion into this process than is appropriate. As I said, um, the, the, the vast majority of um, police contacts relate to low-level misdemeanor, or mostly citation matters, not core public safety um, cases, and that's what we should be refocusing the police department on. So those are my comments, and thanks. Um, thanks, Casimir. Thank you very much for those comments. We do appreciate them. We'll give one last chance for Mr. Les Messinger, if you're there. And if you're unmuted, please make comments. Yeah, can you hear me now? Go, Les. Can you hear me? Hear you. Oh, yeah. OK. I am so sorry. I apologize to the board and everyone else. Uh, I just, uh, my computer is. Uh, on the blitz or I'm on the blitz <laughs> either way um, I want to thank everyone uh, for this meeting I want to thank the public uh, for their input to us um, I want to thank the board uh, for you to uh, uh, working with us this day um, I, th I feel really that we really need to with the homeless situation in the uh, mentally handicapped uh, folks and that we really before we start spending money we really need to look for a place for these homeless to go now these people are the same people that ride our uh, uh, trains why did they ride our trains because they have no other place to go it's dangerous for them on the street so they gravitate towards our trains. You, you kick them off the trains, but they come back. So where the problem really is, if we look at it, we need to get with the different counties and cities on our areas. And then when we talk with these people and define what's if they need mental help if they just need help we can send them to places to go otherwise they're just going to keep coming back and back and back we can help them uh, now we've had social workers in san francisco for almost uh seven years now uh under amando sandoval and uh he's done a pretty good job uh but we need more social workers. Uh, we need, uh, say, four in uh, 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 San Francisco area and five. Okay, yes. Les, we've lost you there. Are you still on? Okay, we have uh, gone through the members of the PCRB. We did lose uh, Mr. Messinger towards the end, but he had opportunities to speak. And so we are uh, approaching um, the two-hour uh, limit of the meeting, but we're going to proceed. It goes Mr. Messinger, uh, yes. Les, we, we lost you there for a bit. Can you give us a 15-second sum up since we're running out of time? Uh, you're muted. You're still muted. You got to push the button, the unmute button. We're still muted. I'm sorry. I, just, 
Given the time, Les, I'm sorry, but I think we should move on because we need to hear from the board of directors. Um, there will be more opportunities for us all to speak. So let's move on, Mr. Casimir. Thank you, David. I do appreciate that. It is time. And let's move to the board of directors and starting with President Latifa Simon. Um, I'll take 15 seconds. This is a process uh, for sort of listening and learning. One of the things I would say, I would like to thank our chair um, because you're, in your own comments, you, uh, you, you made clear that any stakeholder process must be centered in data, uh, must also be centered um, and, and being willing to hear things that um, are, are difficult from stakeholders, from law enforcement, from community, folks on different sides of the issue. And I believe our collective task, both members, and I said this at the beginning of the meeting, of our board of directors um, and of the CRB, um, it, we'll, we'll make decisions together with our police chief and with our general manager that um, move us forward. Um, the empirical data nationally is clear. Um, folks want to understand how safety can be increased, not just in public transit spaces, but in public spaces. Um, and there is so much energy and I believe a public will um, in the Bay Area to, to have uh, th this process actually render um, not only new voices, um, but, but new ideas. Um, and we have our work cut out and my my focus is to be um, a listener and and to implement what we what we know is possible um, and, and that's a safer part. Thank you all so much for being a part of this conversation. Uh, thank you very much, President Simon. Let's move to Vice President Mark Foley. Um, first off, I wanted to say thank you for the opportunity for us to, to come together and discuss this important issue and this is just the start of the dialogue, so I appreciate that. Um, for me, it's it's looking at you know what is the goal of our police. Um, I think it's keeping our passengers and our employees safe, um, but we need to realize that uh, being safe and feeling safe are two vastly different things, often driven by racism or socioeconomic bias. Um, so I don't know that the solution is shifting more funds away from police staffing. Um, we need police and we need to address the need for social services support and mental health experts in our system. Um, you know, this continues to be a bigger issue than just BART. We all know that. Um, the reality is it's cities, counties, and the state that are not helping us. We need their assistance to provide sufficient mental health services and homeless outreach for folks that are in need. Um, so when I think about police reform, or in this case for me, it's about refocusing. Um, and, I, and I ask the question, you know, is there a better policing model out there? And if so, what does it look like? Um, you know, what are the other agencies doing that we're not doing? Is there anything different out there that we should be exploring? And I think lastly, you know, I would ask Chief Alvarez, um, continue to ask the Police Citizens Review Board and the BART Police Union leadership, what are your recommendations on what we should do differently to ensure passengers and employees can safely ride BART? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for your comments. Moving right along, we'll go to uh, Director Deborah Allen. Hi there. Um, so I'm I'm not going to be able to turn the camera on. I apologize. Um, but uh, so first of all, there there are so many things presented here. I want to thank all of you for taking the time to present. You know your thoughts and and uh, lots of different perspectives. Uh, even the the callers from the public. Um, some good comments there. Um, on defunding, what we're talking about here is defunding. We can't really, you know, say it's anything else. I get that maybe some don't want that to, to be characterized that way, but if you're going to replace officer duties with civilians, there's only one sum of money, and we, particularly in this particular situation we're in, uh, in the pandemic, we have no more money to go, go after. So it's going to be taking money away from sworn police to put into civilian uh, or social workers or whatever, you know, the program ends up being. 
um, the end result will be defunding BART police officers. And um, so I, I do agree. Someone said we must be centered in data. I agree with that wholeheartedly. Um, coincidentally, last week, a Gallup poll was released um, where they asked the question, would you rather the police spend more time, the same amount of time or less time as they currently spend in your area? This was a national poll. Um, and, uh, you know, overall, um, it was about 86% of people of all uh, uh, cultures and races um, said the same amount of time or more. It was then broken down by race and Black Americans said 81% uh, of them said they wanted uh, the police to spend the same amount of time or more in their areas. Um, so I, I encourage everyone to take a look at that. Um, on drug activity in the system, and I want to break this down, that I want to focus back on the RCI. People using illicit drugs openly on the train are committing a crime. Only a police officer can address that activity currently. You can't send a civilian in to deal with that unless we want to just decriminalize drug use on the trains. And I don't have any writers in my district that would be very happy about that. Okay, um, thank you very much. You've uh, uh, approached the two minutes. Can we two, wait, wrap it up? wait, wait, wait. We're only getting two minutes now? Two minutes for directors. Uh, but you let others go on uh, way past their three minutes, and now you're going to cut me off. Okay. Would you please wrap it up and continue so we can sure. move forward with past the time frame? Yeah. Thank I, you. I, I mean, I, I think this, you know, there's a key point here, and it is that, and, and several have said this, that our county and city governments, um, maybe our state government too, are not providing the right kind of help in our society for the mental health and homeless cases. Um, but we, we are paying for core teams to address this in the system now. And what I'm told when I ask the question, why do they keep coming back in? The answer is they have nowhere to go. So how will creating a whole new program within BART of social workers or whatever you know, our program looks like, they still will have nowhere to go. So I don't know how, what kind of problem we're solving here. We're solving a societal problem that isn't going to get solved by us in transit. Um, so I think our, our police officers have become de facto mental health workers because of that systemic failure of our society and our local governments. But police are now being targeted as the problem by some people, even in this room, but they're not the problem. They're only available, they're just the only available help in many cases, and so they do their best. So um, I, I have a lot more to say. I'm really, I gotta tell you, I'm really disappointed that you wait all the way to the end of this meeting and then a director gets two minutes to talk about these very important issues. So I'll just stop there, thank you. Thank you, and I appreciate your understanding. We are at the end of the meeting, and uh, we appreciate the comments of directors. Let's move to Director Elizabeth Knapp. Before we do that, Ken, um, this is the chair. It's 6.03. I'd like to move to extend the meeting to 6.30 um, as a housekeeping matter. We won't extend it beyond that. I think we can so wrap up the meeting. I'll so have a, a motion. I have a motion. Uh, Mr. Perez Velez seconds it. Um, anyone against, please uh, say nay. Uh, it passes unanimously. Thank you, uh, Mr. Kazimir. Thank you, uh, Chairman. And let's proceed then with uh, Director Elizabeth Ames. Yeah, I think this is a golden opportunity to really engage our um, city and county partners. I attended meeting with Supervisor uh, Miley and the assistant DA was there. There were health professionals there, mental health professionals. And I think because of what's happened, uh, you know, people are, you know, basically pinpointing this on the police department, but I think it's really a societal concern and uh, it's a rotating, revolving door uh, in the courtroom. You know, when people go to jail, they go in and out of jail. It happens on the streets. You think about people in public, like the public works departments in the cities, they eliminate the homeless off the streets. And then where do these people go? So they lost their belongings, where they live. 
And I think that's really the source of the issue too. Where do, where do these homeless go if they lost everything? Well, they might take public transit. So I really do believe uh, we need to have the police um, in my district, I'm, I have concerns. They have concerns about their safety. And it's essential that we not reallocate resources right now and work with our partners first, then come up with a plan and deploy a collaborative approach. So I hope that makes sense. And thank you for your comments. And thank you very much for your comments. I do appreciate that. Director Bevan Duffy. Hey, thank you so very much. And I, I just want to take a moment to, uh, again, thank the members of the BPCRB. Um, it's been wonderful to be part of this meeting. Uh, I know one of my colleagues, uh, Director Rayburn, is, is a regular attendee, and so I want to give him some props for that. Uh, I appreciate the work that is being done. And I think that we really have a great opportunity because the fact is we're not alone. We're not like wandering in the wilderness here. There are transit agencies and there are cities across this country that are reckoning just like we are, looking at how we can conduct our operations and how we can create public safety without feeding into systemic racism and white supremacy. And so I absolutely believe that that can be done. And I think that there were a lot of great comments I briefly want to say that um, one, one of the uh, committee members asked some questions about the level of engagement that BART has had with local governments around homelessness. And as Director Allen cited, uh, she and I and a former director, Joel Keller, met with uh, the Contra Costa Homeless Services, the core team, and um, brought that back to the board uh, during the past four years when most of us as a fairly new board, six out of the nine of us have, have held office. Uh, we had the SF hot team that was not really meeting our needs specifically because it didn't appear that they had um, housing or treatment services that they could help people move quickly to. And so we've changed some of our work to be working with the Salvation Army, which does have those facilities. And several of us on the board went and testified at the Alameda County uh, Board of Supervisors when their grand jury report raised questions about how we can effectively deal with homelessness. So I think that this is a subset of um, an overall effort that we'll be conducting, but I think that we can um, do some things and I think that we need to strengthen um, the accountability of county governments to, to really try and help us and not just put us at, at the back of the line because uh, we cannot be successful without those resources. So uh, I really in, enjoyed participating in today's meeting and I really look forward to working with my colleagues in the weeks and months ahead to achieve the goals that we talked about today. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments. We do appreciate them. Director Janice Lai. Um, it's Janice Lee, thank you. Um, so given I have like two minutes here, I'm going to just talk like really fast. So just please forgive me. Um, first, I just want to really thank everyone for coming to this meeting, speaking for to staff for staffing this meeting, and certainly a lot of thanks to CRB. I'm going to and the rest of the board are going to be asking a lot of you over the coming months, um, possibly over the coming years to really be convening and putting a lot of attention and energy onto this issue. So I'm thanking you in advance for that work and for work you've already done. Um, I, I do want to talk a little bit about the process, but this is really why I saw this meeting as. So I want to be clear that this is not an exhaustive process. Um, it'll likely be iterative and really the outcome of this and what I am hoping to get out of this process over the coming months and the robust outreach that will happen is to have real proposals we can actually turn into reality through the October budget revisions and potentially future budget revisions. Um, I want these budget things to become real with the real actions that the bar board can be taken, taking. The other thing that I really want to make sure happens is that we have a venue for this work that really needs to be done. Um, that could be the CRB, it could be a working group, it could be a special committee, I, I don't really care, but there needs to be transparency and there needs to be real accountability and follow-ups so that staff can be bringing back information that we as board members and CRB members are requesting so that we are doing this work between now and October. We don't have that much time. Um, the, the last thing I do really sort of want to talk about is sort of the semantics of like defunding, not defunding. Listen, I'm just gonna be honest. I might be a minority voice in this, 
but I am open to defunding. And I think we have to be open to defunding. Now, I may be a total minority in this, and that's okay. I am 100% committed to working with you all, to working with the general manager, to working with, the chief, with chief Alvarez, to working with everyone to figure out what the resources we are, uh, we need um, to uh, get the resolutions that we need to make sure that ultimately we are in the path to building a world-class transit system. That is how I started my term at BART. That is what we talked about at, you know, in 2019 at our annual workshop. And I still believe that despite the pandemic, despite what's happening, we can still get there. Now, this idea that this I, defunding comes from a mob, I think that's absolutely ridiculous. There are real proposals on the table with the Minneapolis City Council. That's not a mob. Seattle City Council, that ain't a mob either. And I represent the western half of San Francisco where our mayor, Mayor London Reed, is putting forward actual reinvestment proposals. So please don't characterize me as part of a mob or these proposals as part of a mob. We need to work together and not be broken down by the way that we use language because ultimately what we should all be here to do is to be having a safe, reliable transit system that serves Bay Area residents and brings a mobility that our residents, that our constituents in this region absolutely deserves. So we've led on police reform over the past 10 years. I think we can do it again. I think we must do it again and we'll get there together. Thank you. Thank you very much, Director Lee. We appreciate your comments. Uh, Director John McPartland. You mean I have to follow Janice? Wow. Okay. Uh, in reimagining police, uh, police services. Uh, yes, we have to end up doing that. That that has to be not chiseled in stone, but it's got to be in a three-leaf binder. Uh, it needs to be able to evolve, and I think that we've been doing fairly well, fairly well with that so far, but it has to continue to evolve. Um, it's not a case of the PD versus the ambassador program or the de-escalation versus uh, the use of force. It has to be homogenous from the standpoint of having multiple skill sets on um, the good news about taking the homelessness issue and giving that to the ambassadors to deal with uh it takes that burden off of law enforcement from a punitive perspective but it also ends up taking the police force away from that kind of contact that while it's uh, not within their their comfort zone and they're ill-equipped to deal with it, it also puts them in a position where from a training standpoint, uh, law enforcement will end up taking a class on uh, de-escalation and dealing with mental problems and leave it in the classroom, whereas they end up only using their police skill sets. I believe it was um, uh, suggested by one of the members of the board that uh, we should end up making it separate between the ambassador program and law enforcement. Uh, I would recommend strongly against that by virtue of the fact that if you have both of those ambassador programs and law enforcement uh, that work side by side and together effectively, uh, both uh, on the street, in the system, as well as uh, in the training that they do, you end up having a cohesive system similar to what you would have with between first responders, police, fire, EMS. They end up meeting themselves and they work out with one another on a continuous basis. If they are separated, that would be counterproductive. Um, and, and summing it up, uh, we need to end up taking all of the contributing forces that are being impacted by and that have a potential to impact on the problems that we end up having, specifically the CRB, the, NC, the Citizen Review Board, Independent Police Officer, the PD, uh, along with the Ambassador Program, BPOA, the Officers Association, along with the mental health across five different counties. Now, is that uh, within our own resources? I think we're doing that uh, as well as we can right now. That doesn't mean that we don't need to end up doing it better and more cohesively. The problem really is, and it's already been stated by two or three people, that we don't have the ability to end up getting the treatment for the people as far as housing is concerned and for the uh, addicted population in order to be able to provide them with services. That's got to be a seamless and cohesive 
on partnership that we have with the mental health in those different counties. I'm not sure that we're able to do that as effectively as we need to. I know that we're in some cases doing it well, in other cases we're not barely doing it at all. But in point of fact, they are under-resourced. And we are a part of the solution to that, and we need to be able to work continuously and effectively as we possibly can in that regard. Is there a panacea where we can get this absolutely correct? No way in hell. Uh, All right. Are there, is there gonna end up being a chance for us to end up doing it fairly well uh, with the resources that we have and that we can end up collectively and get um, a leverage with one another on? Yes. Uh, I'm afraid that it's going to need a lot of diligence for, simply from the pers perspective that it has a heck of a lot more ways to go wrong than it has to go right. Thank you very much, Director McPartland. We thank you for your comments, and uh, we're going to move forward. And so now we'd like to uh, call upon Director Robert Rayburn. Looks like you need to unmute yourself, Director Rayburn. Should be a button in the upper right hand of the screen. Yeah, thank you. Thank you to everyone who's called in today and to the CRB members for your dedication. Uh, and um, also, Mr. Casimir, I want to share that over the past week, I've attended six of the National Association for Civilian Oversight of Law Enforcement workshops. I've learned tremendous uh, new ideas that I think will be flowing through. I've already had discussions about community and stakeholder engagement, uh, more youth involvement with Russell uh, and as part of how we can roll out our alternative dispute resolution program. Um, I want to share with everyone that BART board has already taken action to reduce fair enforcement interactions. It's called new fair gates. And we're pushing real hard. Staff is getting pushed by every one of us because eventually that will change the dynamic for how our police are used. And more ambassadors in the meantime will be on the trains. I want to see that change happen. Give people peace of mind that people have eyes and ears on the trains looking out over what's going on. Um, the one thing that I want to raise that uh, has been brought up by a few speakers, and that's uh, about what we can change and push for. And I note that California is one of five states that do not have the authority to decertify a peace officer for misconduct. Senator Stephen Bradford has a bill, Senate Bill 731, that I want everyone to begin consideration of, whether it's our chief of police, the rank and file, the CRB, all the staff. His bill seeks to implement a decertification process to ensure public trust by holding peace officers accountable for misconduct. Again, at Senate Bill 731, I hope that we have a robust discussion about this and uh, that we can come back maybe by the next board meeting to consider giving it our thumbs up for uh, approval at the state level. That's all I have to say. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very much for your comments. We do appreciate them. Uh, let's move now to the final director to speak, uh, Director Rebecca Salzman. Thank you. I, I just want to thank everybody who's spoken this afternoon and evening and to the BPCRB for all of the work you've done over many of you many, many years. Um, We've made a lot of progress at BART, and there's clearly also a lot more that we can do. Um, I want to make clear that the RCI I introduced, it was in conjunction with our budget and with the budget amendment that 
director Dufty introduced, and we did this in conjunction with directors Lee and um, President Simon. Um, and we worked on this thinking about the budget. I've heard a lot of great recommendations today from CRB members about other things that need to be done. So I just wanted to make clear this was kind of in conjunction with the budget. I think a lot of the other things you're talking about today don't necessarily have to do with the budget. They have to do with policy and I'm eager to work with all of you on that. Um, it's part of why I requested having this joint meeting. Um, I feel a little bit bad that I didn't request this joint meeting years ago because I think it's been really productive. I know a lot of us BART directors try to come when we can, but it's, you know, on and off, except for Director Rayburn, who has maybe perfect attendance. Um, but it was important for me to get the full board together with the full CRB so we could all listen to one another and learn from one another and listen to the public. So I, I hope we do get to do this again. Um, and even before we do get to do this again, I would love to hear more from the CRB. And maybe since we have this public process going on, I would recommend that we get an update from some member of the CRB at at least one meeting a month coming up for the next few months and maybe beyond that about the work that you're doing, about any recommendations you have that might need concurrence from the BART board, or even if they don't, that you just want to let us know about so we're not, you know, both working on the same thing separately or working at cross purposes ever. Um, I want to bring our work much closer together. Um, finally, I just want to speak to, you know, I've heard from a lot of the public commenters and from the members of the CRB about how the issue that this RCI seeks to address in the budget amendment is that the BART police and police in general are not the best equipped to deal with some of the issues that they deal with day in and day out. And we've heard from several people who say that this is the majority of the issues that they deal with. Um, we want them to be able to focus on the serious crimes. And I absolutely want to make sure that they are available to do that. Um, I also want to make sure that they have the support and have other people to handle other issues, which I know I've heard from some people feel intractable, um, but we still need to address them as we continue to work with our city and county partners. Um, and I think the ambassador program is really one of the best ways to do that, but I'm open to whatever comes out of this community process. And, and I appreciate that we're starting it, and I really appreciate that Chief Alvarez has been so open to the ambassador program and to this process. So. I look forward to working with all of you um, and please, I will be reaching out to each of the CRB members, but feel free to reach out to me anytime as well. Thank you very much, Director Salzman. That concludes all of our um, board members and our PCRB members. We thank you for that. That was a very good exchange. And I'm very pleased to have been part of this. I would like to say that the uh, comments that were made by the members will be forwarded to the board of directors. Your civilian oversight agency will be heard, has been heard tonight, and will be heard in the future. So thank you very much. We had a short time frame, but I want to thank you all for working together to get us to the point where we are. We're a little bit be over, over the time frame, but that's okay. We did it, and we thank you. And so we will be forwarding information gleaned to the Board of Directors. So thank you very much for your participation. And I'd like to turn it back over now again to Chair Risk to close us out. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Kazmier. Um, I think um, I appreciate everybody who's been here. Thank you for spending two and a half hours together to um, talk about this really important subject. Um, it sounds like there is consensus building around a process that um, has uh, input from all of the stakeholders, um, including the CRB, including the board. Um, and I, I personally would favor some type of working group. I think the CRB should remain um, a forum for updates and discussions about this issue in the two months that come um, before October. Um, I'm happy responding to Director Saltzman's um, comments to come speak to the board at the meeting at the board meetings 
um, between now and then. Um, and I think that ultimately, though, it, it, it will fall um, to the general manager's office and cons consultation with the CRB and um, the board um, to set the next steps. But I look forward to it. And I think um, we have our, our, our work cut out for uh, us. Um, and I plan to hold us all accountable um, uh, in the months that come. Mr. Kazmier, did you have anything else that you wanted to add before we adjourn? Hearing none, uh, we will adjourn with that. Thank you again, um, and we will follow up with next steps. Thanks, Thank folks. you, Chair.